Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 667. Science Faction, oldest site in Oregon, and the drug that keeps on giving. Cocaine. Yes, it does keep on giving because it's continually Until it awesome. Takes everything. <laughs> okay, I mean, but like, it's a rich man's drug. You want to dance with the rich man's drug? You gotta have, you gotta have fuel to feed the beast. Otherwise, just just do crack like like uh, like the pores do. Which actually, I you know, Bobby, I don't know. Like, uh, f- promise me this: if huh. all of a sudden something happens, I get my prostate checked tomorrow, and it turns out I have like some advanced uh, disease. Yes. Um, I don't want to die without having done crack. Do crack with me. Really? So no, I don't me. want to do crack with you. You're Morgan Freeman. I'm Jack and Jack Nicholson. This is my bucket list. Do crack <laughs> with me. <laughs> I feel like there is never, like, there are people who are like, man, I was really uptight, and then I smoked some weed, and, and you know, it helped improve my life. That's not everybody. Sometimes people have substance use disorder. Sometimes it's bad for you. Uh, that's certainly true. I've, I've heard from a lot of people with uh, hallucinogens. Oh, man, you know, mm. something was going wrong in my life, and I tried mm. this, and it really changed my outlook, and my life is better for it. I have never heard anybody be like, man, my life was really laggy, but then I tried some crack, and now it's fucking awesome. Um... I would trade places with Hunter Biden in a second. So do not. I don't, I, was there crack allegations there? He's not the lame brother who died. Uh, uh, well, he died of cancer. That's tragic. But the one who who was like an officer, a lame ass military officer. No. Um. Uh, yeah. Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden uh, is is a is a known is a known crackhead. Does cocaine. He's a oh, party wow. guy. He's he's legitimately awesome because any smear <laughs> campaign like Hunter Biden has unprotected sex with prostitutes and he released a picture of his penis and the picture of his penis it's like a good cock and you're like <laughs> wow you're like I I can't hate this guy. <laughs> It's like minimum B plus cock. Like you, you no one's no one's down, and that's a harsh grader. Yeah, you're, you're. I mean, you're, you're grading to porn standards. So anything that's, you know, anything that's, that's, uh, that's uh, above a C is something to, to write home about. Oh uh, dear! If you want to be above our C, go ahead and check out our Patreon. You can search Robert Timothy on Patreon for an extra episode of Science Faction every single week. Also, check out Awful Neutral. We are a uh, comedy science podcast. It's my Dungeons and Dragons. Wait, you're a comedy science club? No, 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 no. That was a lie. I was, uh, I'm used to promoting science faction at the end That's of, right. uh, and I went into that script. No, uh, we are Awful Neutral. We are a Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Uh, and while Bobby will have nothing but vitriol to say about it, what he can say without lying, he won't say it, but what he could say without lying is mm. that the, the cast of the show has some of the funniest people Bobby knows in his life. Yes, and I don't. I'm not sure what what you have and over their heads in terms of threats to get them on your horrible show that does really bad things and promotes a a just nerdy form of misadventure entertainment. Okay, I want everybody to know that Bobby hates all like a lot like there's a lot of the nonsense Bobby's on board with all the dick talking, D's nuts jokes, stuff yes. like that. But stuff that, like like shenanigans that Bobby's not a huge fan of is a lot of like wacky voices and stuff. Like like when I, like when I first started doing uh, Damien Simmons the Dead Scientist, Bobby was against it. It wasn't until fan feedback uh, did he realize, oh, I'm I'm the I'm the stodgy old dean of the college trying to outlaw the cool frat house. To be fair, fan feedback is a novelty Mexican wrestler that we went to go see who convinced me <laughs> that I had Dude, not looked awesome. at things the fully. Dude, the guy's legit. <laughs> he, he has a giant spinning fan on his head. <laughs> After he body slammed you around a couple times, you changed your mind. <laughs> Anyhow, awful neutral. Uh, we also do. We also live stream every Sunday at eleven a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Join us. All right, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. No joke. The podcast is legit funnier than this one. Do you learn anything about science? No, you don't. You don't, admittedly, but we double down on the comedy. You walk away feeling good about your day because some funny ass people. But bad about your dick because they show a lot of Hunter Biden dick photos. That'll make you be like, oh, man, my dick isn't great. I got my vein (laughs) placement is not ideal. (laughs) 
this is the best plug you've ever given for the podcast. And I don't think you realize it. Like people are going to be coming nonstop for that. Just out of curiosity first. And then they're going to stay, sit there and admire it for longer. I just like the idea that somewhere there's like a dick judging contest and one of the boxes that you can check as to why you're marking down the dick, you're, you're giving it, you're, you're taking points away from the dick and it's beauty contest is uh, poor vein placement. Yes, that, that Matt, listen, I'm. It looks like a spiral staircase. It just wraps around the day. It's weird. I am an ACC member. That's right. The, uh, the uh, American Cock Club. Um, uh-huh. I'm not a judge. Hopefully one day I will be allowed to go over there, you know, where they, where they, you know, a bunch of contestants come by with their penises, you know, there's, and there's all different categories, you know, there's like the, uh, the chode category where a lot of like short girthy guys are, you know, judged and, you know, they obviously, you know, I go up, I would go up if I was a judge, uh, stick my finger in the scrotum, ask them to cough. And, um, well, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what I'm looking for. That's kind of a trade secret, but. I heard when it comes to that club, you're uh, you're not just the president; you're also a client. <laughs> it's I'm also the webmaster, and really, I'm the only. It's I get unemployed actors and homeless guys to show up in my garage, <laughs> and we film episodes of this. And I I, I kind of put on a lot of airs with how prestigious this was. <laughs> There's a lot of Chinese finger traps disguised as medical devices. We'll leave it at that. All right. uh, Article number one, an 18,000-year-old rock shelter site in Oregon. How many other science podcasts will spend the first five minutes (laughs) discussing vein placement on a cock and then jump right into Paleolithic early occupation of America sites? Yes, this is this is this was the dream of our Paleolithic ancestors. Was to one day they would uh, create a people who would ponder the deep questions like, "What does the perfect cock look like, and how would one judge it?" As we've discussed numerous times on the show recently, including uh, a lot of ancient art is dick centric. There's a lot of dicks in ancient art, and so in a way, this podcast is a continuance of a tens of thousands of year old tradition. Dude, it, it is there is there is nothing more scientific than that. In fact, I was actually thinking the other day if aliens came to Earth and and, uh, and like you know spent time amongst humans in the notes, they'd be they talk about their genitals a lot. It's it is it, uh, like a, a a large percentage of their speech daily uh, references penises specifically. Also, if we really want to get the jump on them, all we have to do is reference the number sixty nine, and for some reason they all go noise. <laughs> we don't even know. we were conditioned. You know? Yeah, so it's like you can't study the species without the, the it changing you. There's no uh, we've contaminated alien life with Stussy S's and 69s. This is a really awesome paper because it details what is uh, likely the oldest site in Oregon, if everything gets confirmed, and one of the oldest sites in the Americas. If we want to reference our oldest sites in the Americas list, we got Cooper's Ferry in Idaho. That's about 16K. We have Buttermilk Creek or the Galt site near Austin, Texas. That has solid dates between 16.8 all the way up to 18K. Uh, those are, It's a little bit muddy as to if they're in straight stratigraphy, so there might be some question about it, but we think we have 18K dates there. The Was it the John Galt site? Was it, uh, was it eradicated by oppressive government? Yeah, there were two... There's too much regulation and not enough of like using homeless people for target practice. That's why the John Galt site went away. <laughs> I earned this by having money. I am by having archaeological sites. I have merit. Then there's White Sands, New Mexico, which we talked about. That's the one with the the footprints of like giant ground sloths and shit, and then human footprints in them. We dated that one based on some uh, radiocarbon dates from seeds that were insides of those footprints, and those seeds might. There's some argument as to whether or not they had some aquatic nature to them, and if they did, if the calibration was done right. But those come in at 23k, but we're not 100% sure. There is some less tenable stuff in South America that's supposedly dated in the high 20s, maybe even early 30k. That's not really that solid and there's that cave in mexico we talked about that's at you know 23 to 30 and that one has some issues because it's a cave and there is some rock fall off the walls of the cave and things like that and stratigraphy can get messed up in a cave so there is some issue because of how that the one caves, is dated. So, scientists are terrified of caves yes so, that's it too uh, you yes. can see <laughs> But but it's in the There's a lot of cave. science ghost stories about caves that we all listen to going through grad school and then you just never want to go into a cave is it true that there are many species of bats in the cave? 
Uh, so while this wouldn't necessarily immediately rocket it to the oldest site in the Americas, depending on where you put your credence in Buttermilk Creek site and where you put it in the White Sands sites and a couple of the other ones, it could theoretically be considered one of the, if it confirmed, one of the oldest dated sites in the Americas. Very, very cool. So this is a rock shelter, not quite a cave. It's only, it's like less than 10 feet. I think they said three meters deep and about 20 meters long. So very long and very narrow. But this area, if you, I looked up pictures of it and stuff, is this kind of like deserty sage scrub flattish area. So while not quite a cave, this is about as close as you get in that area. And we think a long time ago when this comes from 15 to 18,000 years ago, there was a stream nearby and stuff. It was a pretty nice place to hang out, a little rock shelter area. And they've been digging this site, which is on BLM land since like 2011. And in 2012, they found camel teeth. Remember, camel and horses evolved in North America and then made their way out there later. Uh, they found camel teeth under volca volcanic ash from Mount St. Helens. And we know that particular eruption of Mount San St. Helens has been very solidly dated to about 15,000 years ago. And then they found two scrapers, which are a stone tool, a lithic shaped stone tool. And one they found in 2012 with bison blood on it was underneath that 15,000 year old uh, Mount St. Helens, Mount St. Helens eruption, but also underneath some teeth that were found in between the two, in between the eruption and uh, those scrapers. And the radiocarbon dating on those camel teeth that they found gave back dates of 18,250 years before present. Now, again, that's just on the camel teeth themselves. We don't necessarily know that those camels were butchered. They could have naturally died and gone in there. We do have scrapers, which have bison blood on them. So we looked at the, these agate scrapers that we think are even lower strata, and they have bison blood indicating that, you know, they were used and hunted with and stuff, possibly older than that 1825 date and definitely and possibly older than that 15,000 year old date of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Now, the reason I say po possibly is if you go by superposition, which is just basically the oldest stuff is on the bottom, then these scrapers, you can say they're older than everything. They must be older than 18,250 years old. Maybe they're even 20,000 or more years old. We The reason we can't say this is because this is a rock shelter. We talked about this a little bit with that Mexican cave site. The stratigraphy in caves gets all messed up because parts of the cave will collapse and fall down and and it's not uniform how it does that. So it can cover things and push them down to lower levels uh, while other infill comes in and fills it in. A lot of times sediment moves differently inside of a cave and accumulates very differently and sometimes very quickly and pushes stuff around. And not only that, but especially in caves that we know were settled by people and human beings lived in there. Guess what human beings tend to do when they're in caves? They bury shit, whether it's literally shit. I they thought you were going to say to shit. Like, yeah, I, I, too, like actually. just 90% of the time it's bad. I mean, all jokes aside, it's, I thought like they're in dark places. Yeah, they'd bang, of course. There's shelter. There would still be people here if they didn't, right? So they definitely bang. But uh, a lot of times, whether it's literal shit, like you want to shit outside the cave, but you know, if something happens and you can't, if and you have to shit inside the cave, you bury it. But also if you have something that you want to- You got to uh, put on your hide. sandals in the middle of the night. You know, yeah, your, exactly. Your, your, your ass is exploding because you've had uncooked meat. Keep in mind, <laughs> so there's like megafaunal- fucking carnivores and shit out there too that might kill you so maybe you don't want to go out there in the middle of the night but regardless you bury stuff also maybe if you have a valuable tool you're going to leave it someplace and you're going to bury it because uh, you and your family are, are somewhat nomadic and when you leave that place especially if it's covered in bison blood it might get fucked up by animals or other people or something so you might bury it so they could not be in good superposition in which case, then, you know, it might not mean anything that we have dates on the camel tooth in 1825, but, you know, and these scrapers were below that. You might not be able to assume that those scrapers are necessarily older. But if they are and everything checks out, we would have human occupation of these er this area of Oregon at at least and likely decently older than 18,250 years ago, which would make it the oldest known or definitively dated site in Oregon, which is a pretty big deal because Oregon has the Paisley Caves, which are which has, you know, solid 14.5 dates, which for a while was one of the oldest sites in the Americas. So very, very cool to keep pushing these dates back. Remember, the Americas are settled from the West Coast, so we should see the oldest stuff here. It's always nice to hear the story of my ancestors. You know, uh, you, a white man, come in with your big science magic, big white ivory tower magic. And mm -hmm. while I may scoff, it does provide insight into how my ancestors conquered this land and rid the new world of the evil camel. Yes. I mean, 
Except for the, the llamas, which are a relative of the camel, which you guys allowed to live. So, I mean... The, the llamas were the sellouts. They, uh, they traded sides mid, midway through mm. the war and gave humanity the advantage against the camel. Which is why we give them plenty of oats. What about alpacas? Alpacas are, like, related to llamas. What do, they seem, like, nicer and their fur is they softer. They sat on the fence. And we remember <laughs> them. <laughs> Never fucking trust an alpaca. Alpacas are the Switzerland of camelids. <laughs> yeah, once once we won, once we wiped out the camel, uh, and, they, you know, unlike the old world, which allows them to run rampant and eat children, yes. uh, we stomped them out here, and it was... Uh, and. Uh, it was after we won that the alpaca came in. Hey, great, great job. We did a great job, guys. All of us together, cumulatively. We got rid of the camels. Where are those oats? Throughout this rock shelter, we see stone tools, tooth fragments from Pleistocene animals, including bisons and camels and remains of animals and stuff. Very, very cool. Uh, very neat to see the possibility of, of putting another old site there. Because, again, every one of these really opens up. This is we're talking about a small group that's entering the Americas a long time ago. So this is looking at a very one of a very small number of individuals that are colonizing this massive landscape in one of the last huge Wild West adventures of mankind. It's just such a fucking cool story that is slowly being unraveled in the dirt in places like this cave in Oregon. I'm curious because we got rid of so many megafaunal species here in the new world. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious which one would have tasted the best, you know, like, uh, like if I'm going into like a, a wacky hmm. exotic burger place, you know, uh, with, with the North American camel have stacked right. up, you know, or uh, is it a mammoth? mammoth, maybe a mastodon, maybe, you know, uh, maybe it's a, one of the ones you were not going to expect saber tooth cat, you know, yeah, saber tooth cat. I don't. I see. That's. I. I first off, uh, I would get uh, like an ancient form of uh, what's what's the fucking uh, disease you get? <laughs> yeah, toxoplasmosis that makes you like turn into a caveman. I think that's the way science f- fiction works. Yeah, um, it's it's it basically is like uh, it's the the Last of Us, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's how the Last of Us happens. That's that's how science would do it. Uh, dear article number two. Can the diabetes drug turned weight loss drug also be an addiction treatment drug? It does everything. Like it, 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 like it. No joke is like it gives you confidence, makes you, uh, get makes you healthier mentally. It's it's like yeah. uh, the closest thing to that limitless drug. In a way, if you think about it, any drug that helps you lose weight, especially in your younger years, like the effect multiplies. Like anything that makes you lose weight is technically like a bit of a fountain of youth because it will make you live longer. Like. Especially if you're overweight when you're younger, getting that weight off, the the earlier you do it, the more that makes a difference. And so, like, in a way, if you could take a drug to get skinnier in your younger years, you are basically taking a magic pill that makes you live longer. And get laid more. <laughs> there would be no greater blow to the comedy community if yes. you were to take away fat boys' experiences. That's tr- that is the, absolutely no- true. No specific demographic contributes more to comedy than traumatized former fat men. So we're talking about the drug semaglutide, also known by some of its brand names, one of which you might know is Ozempic. Uh, and we have covered this drug like almost its entire life. We discovered we covered some of the early testing on it that was done in the early 20 teens when we first started out and talked about what a big deal this is going to be at that time for people with diabetes. And then studies started coming out when it was only used on label for diabetes, only in very limited circumstances, about how much it was dramatically reducing weight loss. And we covered that as breaking news. And wow, what an interesting thing. This might you know, be the answer to America's obesity epidemic. And as it started making waves as in a very effective weight loss drug, we, we continued to cover it now. Obviously, it's something that is a household name. You, most people probably know what Ozempic is or at least have heard of it. Jessica Simpson, um, my wife has instructed me is one of, is one of the big, uh, you know, she's somebody who's kind of struggled with weight, you know, uh, uh, all her life. But uh, recently, you know, d- despite like what being in her forties, uh, mm. she like looks great, and uh, and apparently she's denying that it's Ozempic, but it's clearly Ozempic. Okay, girl. <laughs> So pretty interesting. Now, first of all, I want to talk about something. We we talked about this. We talked about Ozempic a little bit a few months ago. And there is this idea going around that people who need it for diabetes can't get it because other people are using it for weight loss. There have been a few rebuttals to that because that isn't necessarily how drugs work. Oftentimes they're they're 
prepared for for the market that they're being used in or their on label use. And so like there actually isn't evidence of less ozempic being produced for people with diabetes. In fact, that number has gone up. It's just that more people with diabetes are using it. And the production stream for the non-diabetes side, for the weight loss side, is done separately and began when it got cleared by the FDA for weight loss use and like is supposedly, at least in some cases, it's made at a different factory. The production line, like everything about it is different sometimes down to the manufacturer. So that might be more of an appearance that we get. There might still be some people who are, let's say, they're not quite diabetic or they could be using other diabetes medication, but they know this can help them lose weight as well. So they're choosing to do that, even though they have the diabetes thing. But in general, those using it for the the weight loss aspect are usually not taking it out of the same pool as those from the diabetes aspect. See, I had thought it, that it was one of those misleading things that didn't affect it uh, because in America, if you have diabetes, you can't afford insulin mm. uh, most of the time. And so you don't actually live long enough to get the uh, the other diabetes medic more expensive diabetes medications. Yeah, yeah, that could be it. Like we 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 just kill those people off early enough with the expensive insulin. Well, with the lack there, or we're by pricing them out of the market. Listen, um, <laughs> the market has spoken. You know, there could be times where it's being diverted, so it can't be completely kind of dismissed. But it seems like a lot of what we think is, oh, it must be people using it for weight loss. They're taking away from people who need it for diabetes. It's, that's probably not generally true. Again, it seems like those production streams are different ones. And even sometimes the companies that make them are different and they're going through different things. So like, they're, it's, it's more like whatever is being produced for weight loss purposes is has been produced for that purpose and would not have otherwise been produced for the other purpose. But regardless, it would be nice to get it out to more people at a much more affordable cost. I was seeing some of the costs on this and I, some of these are many, many hundreds of dollars a week, which is, I, I don't know who gets to just like randomly afford that. Like, I'm not sure how that works. What's the point of becoming a scientist, Bobby, if you can't afford Ozempic uh, money? Like what's the point of you? you uh, I'm, I, no, I, we talked about this before on the show. Fuck that. I would not take that for a million years. It is a shot. And it's like once a week or something like that. Fuck that. I hate needles. I even said I will gladly go on an 800 calorie a day liquid diet for some for like two and a half, three months. Then I would go get a shot once a week. It, this is a this is a gift you give to your wife. You'd be coming home looking like like Ryan Reynolds every day. I could do the same thing do. on the 800 calorie a day liquid diet and I don't have to get a fucking needle. I don't think. Okay, listen. What if I told you, Bobby, that we turn this? Okay, you pay for it, right? You yes. you do it, and you allow me to administer it every week. I have to figure out a way to trick to dart you. I have no. to figure out a way to give you your to you know trick you into having your medicine, give you that spoonful of sugar, no. and I think it would appeal to your uh, love of traps and avoiding. My hatred of needles would not. I would not want somebody randomly trying to stab me with a needle. That would. That actually sounds like a nightmare of my life. That is. Oh horrible. no! I'd be doing it from long distance with a high-powered rifle. Don't. No. <laughs> I wouldn't. Nobody would stab you, Bobby. Uh, well, what's interesting is there's a bunch of evidence coming out that not only is this good for as a diabetes drug, not only is this good as a weight loss drug, but it might actually be good as an addiction treatment drug. So a lot of the people who have been using Ozempic for weight loss are reporting that the drug has caused them to completely lose interest in former addictive habits, including alcohol, drugs, and even obsessive shopping habits. So super interesting. Now you wonder, wait, is this maybe just like a placebo thing? Is this mind over matter? But these people weren't told that it would do this. So do they have some kind of internal connection in their head? Like, is their head drawing a circle? Oh, this makes me not hungry, which is one of the ways those epic makes you lose weight. This makes me not hungry. And because this makes me not hungry, maybe it makes me not want cigarettes or something. I don't know. It seems weird that that would be something that all those people would infer. But we actually have a mechanism of action that makes sense as to how this could work. And we have previous studies that show that this might be the case. In fact, previous animal studies found that other drugs, which are similar, at least chemically similar to semaglutide, which essentially are mim mimicking a gut hormone uh, called GLP-1, we think that it suppresses not only appetite, but other 
type of seeking behaviors, reward seeking behaviors, including drug seeking behaviors. And in some cases where we're giving it to them for totally other reasons, people who have taken drugs with that have GLP-1 agonists on them, sometimes they like completely stop drinking when they otherwise have some kind of alcohol use stick to disorder, or they completely stop smoking cigarettes when they've smoked a pack a day for, for 20 years. And that's really, really interesting. I didn't think anything would break. Listen, I, I recommend Ozempic to everybody. I didn't think anything could break my adrenochrome addiction. I didn't think I was <laughs> I was three fetuses a day, just straight from the tap. That's that uh, adrenochrome by the, for our fans. I feel, I, I, nobody should venture down that rabbit hole. But that's what the Netzos believe uh, that that uh, it, it was a drug that was made up by Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, in yeah. a, and uh, <laughs> it's in the a movie. idea that it's like you're like eating part of a baby. It's like a hormone a baby has that fills you with life and vigor. Yeah. So like if you're a QAnon person, you would believe that Hillary Clinton just like saps, just like puts a baby in a blender. It's like it's, it's, there's some attachment that's just drains the adrenochrome from it, then injects yeah. it. Like that's that's the conspiracy theory. Uh, so if you want to know, fact, she only the, does it to hear them scream. <laughs> <laughs> that's the drug the drug is power yeah and like i said we actually have like a biomechanical explanation for how this could work which is really interesting so we know that whenever you get rewarded by anything but especially those type of stimulus whether it is a food stimulus that could be a fatty food or a super high sugar food it could be something like addictive drugs any, anything like that whenever you get rewarded by it, it causes yeah adrenochrome it causes a release of dopamine in a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. What if I was addicted to weight loss, and but I, but when I started taking it, I realized I no longer needed to. I, I was I was happy with myself, and I didn't need these this Ryan Reynolds body, so I stopped taking it. So it was more of a self esteem boost. Well, I mean, everybody, I was taking it to lose weight. I yeah. lost the weight, and I was addicted to losing weight. And this drug cured my addictive behavior, so now I ballooned mm -hmm. back up to four hundred pounds because I stopped taking the drug. I thought you were saying you just felt so good about yourself, you no longer cared what people thought. It was like you had a real Lizzo vibe going on where you're like, I'm just loving myself no matter what. And so therefore you ballooned back up. Yes, this is um <laughs> this is this is my success story, how I found myself at four hundred pounds. <laughs> Hair toss, check your nails, girl. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sweating at room temperature. What'd you say? <laughs> So we think that, you know, because these drugs can bind to the GLP-1 receptors, that they could actually reduce that dopamine response we get from those stimulus. And if then we're not getting that dopamine response when we take that stimulus, we start associating the two things together. We think that that's a big part of the biochemical addiction cycle is associating that stimulus with that response. And if you can break that association in your mind because you're no longer getting it and the dopamine thing is not working, that might be a really good way to start breaking some of those addictive habits. And that's really, really interesting. My guy's playing the kazoo. He can't, he's not Lizzo. He can't play the flute, but he's, it's, it's inspirational. He's 400 pounds. He's divorced. His wife finds him physically revolting because she yeah. thought she was marrying a Ryan Reynolds type. <laughs> but no. during one of his like blues traveler esque bits, he says to his super supportive audience of uh, like chubby dudes who he gives like like yeah you go you go guy uh, he goes all right guys now this next song I'm gonna use my washboard abs and he, he pulls out like a literal old school washboard like the the old school clothes washing board <laughs> with a lot of grunting by the way there. He puts it against his rather large stomach and starts using it in one of the songs. It's a <laughs> becomes extremely winded because, by the way, we didn't say this. He's 400 pounds at 5'3". This, yes. <laughs> this man is, is, medically, uh, is a medical mystery. Uh, he, he's, he has, he's limited use of his limbs. He's like a weeble more than yeah. anything. Yeah, uh, medically speaking, he's been classified as a boulder. That Legally <laughs> speaking... <laughs> <laughs> Joe Rogan was on his podcast and he couldn't give him and put him in a rear naked. That's how big this guy is. Um, 
So very, very interesting if this is going to be something that, you know, has already become, shown itself to be a, a diabetes drug and, and always already shown itself to be a weight loss drug, if it could also be a addiction treatment drug. Now, this is far from settled, by the way. Using semaglutide for any of this is certainly not settled science. We don't know if that'll be the case, if it will be end up being a good addiction drug, what the percentages will be of your better chance of success if you use it or don't. But again, just like I said before, I'm, I'm happy anytime we have a drug that can help obesity because that is going to help our entire healthcare system. It's going to help people be happier, healthier, live longer, live better lives. But also I'd be incredibly happy if it could also do the same thing for addiction and help treat those things. Because again, what a, what a noble drug that could, that could help cure, that could help treat diabetes, obesity, and addiction. Everybody line up here for a Zembic. It's the miracle drug that'll, that'll make cure you zombified, uh, 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 diabetified, addictified, or fatified. Ozempic has got you covered. It's a miracle drug, a miracle time. <laughs> It does sound like something that was uh, that was like being hucked on a Gwyneth Paltrow esque website, you know. Like it does seem to have very wide reaching and otherwise and like almost superhuman superpower qualities to it. It is a weird choice that all the drug reps have uh, uh, like melodrama, melodramatic mustaches and beards, and have like big stovepipe hats and a black cape <laughs> and travel setting. Would you like to see my wares? <laughs> this is a miracle drug. Oh uh, dear! Thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction Six Six Seven, where you learned about the oldest site in Oregon and how the miracle drug just keeps on giving. Thanks so much for joining us, and come on back next week for Science Faction. Six six eight. So you've declined my wonder drug, Ozembic? Fine. Can I interest you in crack? You've been listening to Science Fiction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>